All right, hello all and welcome to the first annual talk in the Iowa Bibliophiles series. I'm Margaret Gam, Director of Special Collections and Archives here at the University of Iowa Libraries. Before we dive into this evening's events, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the historical homelands of over 15 tribal nations, the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, and Ho-Chunk Nations can continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. For those not familiar with the Iowa Bibliophiles, this group has been convening on the second Wednesday of each month in the academic year since 2002, beginning with Arthur Bonfield's Confessions of the Bibliomaniac that November. After 21 years of incredible talks by local collectors, printers, librarians, archivists, and more, we depart from the tradition of a monthly speaker and begin a new tradition with the first Iowa Bibliophiles guest speaker sponsored by the Friends of the University of Iowa Libraries. Each fall, we will host a visiting speaker, and each spring, we will host a new acquisitions reception. So I hope that you all will continue to join us for that event. We also hope this, that this new tradition reinvigorates the community, sparking new approaches to bibliophilia at Iowa and inspiring a new generation of bibliophiles. So thank you for joining us. This evening's speaker is Dr. Heather Wolf, consulting curator at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. In determining how to introduce her, I discovered various accolades from the broader one of the world's experts in early modern English manuscripts to the more specific fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London. But the most intriguing came from the guardian, uh, Sherlock of the Library. Dr. Wolf stewards the manuscript collection at the Folger and in her spare time teaches people how to read English secretary hand at locales such as for a book school. She also oversees transcription crowdsourcing projects at the Folger. She publishes widely on early modern English manuscripts and hybrid books. Her first book, Elizabeth Carey, Lady Falkland, Life and Letters, received the first annual Josephine Robert Roberts Scholarly Edition Award from the Society for the Study of Early Modern Women. Her essay, The Material Culture of Record Keeping in Early Modern England, co-written with Peter Stolly Brass, received the 2019 Archival History Article Award from the Society of American Archivists. She was also the Mundy Fellow in Bibliography at the University of Cambridge in 2021-22. Dr. Wolf received her BA from Amherst College, her MLIS from UCLA, and her PhD from the University of Cambridge. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wolf. Um, thank you very much, Margaret, for that introduction. And thank you also, Margaret, and uh, thank you to Eric Ensley and Liz Reardon for organizing this visit to the university and to Tim Barrett and Nicholas Clavis for hosting an amazing session this morning in the Center for the Book where we got to make watermarks and make paper and ask lots of questions. I thought I'd share with you tonight some bits and pieces from the project I was working on while I was the Munby Fellow at, in Bibliography at the University of Cambridge in 2021-22, and which I'm now trying to turn into a book. I'm calling the project Paper Matters, Writing Paper in Shakespeare's England, and in it I try to interpret the dance between writing paper and the handwriting upon it. And you know, one of my arguments is that paper is so much more than a silent substrate awaiting inscription. In the years since I've been working on this project, which I started before that sabbatical year, a number of exciting and groundbreaking publications on paper have come out, all of which really build upon the transformative work of Tim Barrett. My own work has greatly benefited from Tim's research and from the research that has come out in these more recent publications, really just, it was like, they all came out in 2019 and 2020 and gave me a lot to chew on as I was starting on my project. So my 
goal for the sabbatical year was to figure out how to get closer to understanding paper as a contemporary of Shakespeare would, not in literary terms, but in a really practical way. When someone needed a sheet of paper to write a letter or jot down some notes or make accounts, what sort of paper would they grab and why? Did they care about texture, thickness, translucence, size, or watermarks, the things that we are so interested in today? I also wondered how much were people paying for paper and was paper considered expensive? And I'm interested in writing paper that was acquired in small batches of a choir or two. And a choir is, uh, consists of 25 sheets of paper. And I'll also use the word ream, and a ream consists of 500 sheets of paper. So 20 choirs um, makes one ream. Perhaps the best way to think about my quest is by looking at our own daily interactions with paper today. We are all paper connoisseurs, not because we are bibliophiles or librarians, but because we deal with so many kinds of paper every single day. Despite the digital turn, we possess a tacit awareness and multi-sensory expertise in distinguishing between the paper we see in magazines and newspapers, notebook paper, store receipts, paperbacks, hardbacks, index cards, post-it notes, parking tickets, Xerox paper, crane stationery, wedding invitations, birthday cards, thank you notes, postcards, Bible paper. Um, some of us remember telephone book paper. And we can probably identify all of these with our eyes closed just by touch and you know, maybe a little bit by sound. This paper sensibility is not a recently developed innate talent. Uh, and so I wanted to sort of recover, excavate what that, how that manifested in the early modern period. How we behave around paper and the judgments we make about it have for centuries been modeled at home, school, the workplace, and the larger built environment, and dictated by local government norms and regulations for recycling and disposal. I ended up combing through thousands of letters, account books, court records, and receipts from the period of approximately 1570 to 1640. And I was examining both the text and the substrate upon which it was written. And I discovered that this was both an exciting time to become a paper snob because of the multiplicity of new choices in Elizabethan England, but it was also a precarious time for the thousands of rag collectors and rag cleaners in London and sorters who became pawns in the city's efforts to regulate the global and domestic trade in rags. And I'll touch on both of those topics tonight. Writing paper is a commodity that has always been simultaneously visible and invisible. Our attention drawn to it only when it is particularly elegant or uh, particularly bad or inappropriate. We think of it as a blank slate, which gains meaning when a person writes or draws on it, but it also conveys its own meaning. So in Shakespeare's time, paper began to be seen as a surface that had a life of its own that could be used strategically and become an extension of the writer, amplifying their message. With the emergence of new kinds of paper in late 16th century England, one's paper choices began to reflect social status and intention. Descriptors for writing paper that I've encountered in manuscript account books and inventories and in receipts in this period fall into five broad categories. And so I've sort of spread them out on this slide here. Um, they, they used words referring to the quality, to where the, plate, where the paper might have come from or where they thought it came from, um, the size, the dimensions of the sheet of paper. Sometimes paper they described in these records by watermark motif, and sometimes by post-production features or add-ons, things that um, embellish the paper in some way. Uh, and unfortunately, the majority of the time, the paper purchases that I encountered are just recorded as simply paper. But in most cases, I can take that to mean ordinary paper when the price is included and I see that it's the price 
for ordinary paper, which I'll get to in a second. These adjectives uh, in this slide reveal what the purchasers understood to be the defining feature for them or the key attribute of their purchase. These adjectives were applied inconsistently because an English language standardized vocabulary for writing paper did not exist. And so um, sometimes you'll see a description which includes adjectives from like three or more of these uh, columns. And, and you can't, it's hard to match apples with apples when you're looking at the records that survive. One of the things that led me to this project was a comment I often heard repeated by Shakespeareans and other scholars, and I probably said it myself too, that paper in this period was scarce and prohibitively expensive. And neither of these assertions are really accurate, and they have limited our, limited our ability to observe the dynamic ways in which early modern writers selected paper that was fit for purpose. So when I go down into the vault at the Folger and you know pull manuscript volumes from the shelf, when I was thinking about this, it dawned on me that like are the paper in the manuscript collection in the vault probably like forty percent of it is blank. We have a ton of blank paper in the vault, and it's not totally blank, but in this case, this is a poetical miscellany that the person has skipped around. And so there are lots of um, blank leave, blank openings. Um, and then you have things like this. This is a letter from John Dunn, uh, which is lovely because he's apologizing to his employer for surreptitiously marrying uh, Anne Dunn. And he signs his name. It's sort of dropping off the bottom right corner of the letter. And that was a trope for showing your humility and your desire for forgiveness and letter writing in the period. But that's not why I picked this. I picked it just to show you that a letter was written on a sheet of paper, which would be folded in half. And you'd write the letter on the front leaf. And then the middle two leaves unfolded would be blank. And then you'd fold it up into a little packet for sending and then write the address on it. So that's what you see on the left side there. Um, so this, this sheet of paper, two out of the four sides are completely blank. An etiquette manual published in 1675 encourages this practice of wastage. It's writers suggesting that when composing a letter, make use of large paper rather than small and a whole sheet, even though we write but six lines in the first page rather than half of one. It's no inconsider inconsiderable piece of ceremony, one showing reverence and esteem, the other familiarity or indifference. And I noticed that even drafts of letters in our collection use this same format uh, of you know, not using the two inside leaves when it's written on a bifolium, which is a sheet folded in half. So the, this reckless consumption or display of paper was not just a convention meant to impress one's friends, it was not even considered decadent. So the argument that paper is expensive has been recycled from bibliographical and book historical studies of the European printed book. Paper constituted nearly half of the production cost for a printed book. Publishing a book required a sizable upfront investment in paper, tying up capital until the final product hit the market. So if you take the publication of a typical quarto of 100 leaves, well, that's kind of a lot, on ordinary paper with a print run of 750 copies, that might require 20,000 sheets of paper. Uh, if printing paper were three pence per quire, you know, that adds up after a while. But it was the scale of paper required to print the books that made paper seem expensive. And this argument doesn't neatly transfer to the much smaller quantities of writing paper purchased by individuals who are purchasing at the quire level, not at the ream level. So, so far, uh, I've collected over 100 examples, somewhat like this one, of paper purchases by individuals and by some Oxford and Cambridge colleges and government departments uh, from the 1570s to the 1640s. 
And these examples, they can only qualify as an example if we have both the quantity of the paper purchased and the amount paid so I could get to a per sheet, level, a per sheet price or per choir price. So the average price of ordinary writing paper was four pence per choir. And this price did not budge for like well over a hundred years, even though the price index for most other commodities in this period increased dramatically. Um, so here the entry is on the last line and it says acquire paper and then four Roman numerals, I's and then a D for pence. So to put this in perspective, the average agricultural or building laborer who might make six to 12 pence a day could purchase up to 75 sheets of paper with one day's wages. They would never need 75 sheets of paper, um, but that's a lot of paper that they could buy. Put another way, if we accept that estimate by the economic historian D.C. Coleman that the annual consumption of white paper per head in England in 1600 was six sheets, and I'm not sure how he arrived at that, that's a penny per year per person spent on paper. So again, for a penny, you could get six sheets of paper. So I think that writing paper was not an expensive commodity for aristocrats or day laborers. And you know, there are other explanations for why, for example, no Shakespeare manuscripts survive or why people were writing in the end leaves of books, but it didn't have to do with paper uh, scarcity or expense. And actually the cost of sending a letter was way more expensive than like the price of the actual sheet of paper that you're writing on. So what, oh, I want to show you this chart too. So there are finer and larger grades of paper as well. And uh, they were significantly more costly, but these would not have been needed by day laborers. And they were generally for higher status people in the period who would not have been impacted by this price. So here I've grouped them by the, um, from this information I've collected, the cheaper version kinds of paper in the left-hand column and the most expensive are on the right side. And there you can see where the adjectives sort of stack up um, to describe how great the paper is. Like Venice, fine, fine Venice, it's gilt and it's folio size. But so let's go back to the ordinary paper, this four pence uh, acquire paper. Made in Normandy might as well have been stamped on it since it's been estimated that up to 98% of paper came from this region of France from the mid 16th century to the mid 17th century. One of the most common watermarks for this kind of paper from Normandy is a pot. And many of you have probably seen this uh, before. It has hundreds of variations and was produced by hundreds of mills over you know, 100, 150 year period. So you can't really localize to the mill where these pots come from. They're just totally generic, ubiquitous pots. The size of this sheet, uh, this kind of sheet, when folded in half to make a bifolium, uh, is, was about the same size as like British A4 paper or American letter paper, or Xerox paper. The affordances of pot paper are made clear in an analogy made by the minister Nehemiah Rogers, in which he compares the relationship between a preacher and his audience to that of a penman and his paper. He says a writer must cut his nib according to the texture of his paper. So paper that had a hard and cross grain would damage a tender pen. Paper with a fine and tender grain works best with a smaller pen. And then Ordinary paper is how he refers to it. And also pot paper of a middle nature is another way he refers to it, requires a nib that is neither too soft nor too hard. So from that, you know, we kind of get the early modern English writers came to associate pot paper with paper that had a good level of gelatin surface sizing and was dried and pressed in such a way as to minimize the ridges um, to make, you know, make it more tender to write on. But they did not expect it to be perfectly white or free from detritus from the rags or the water, which frequently became embedded in 
paper. So it reminds us that paper quality was based not just on aesthetic criteria, but also on practical ones, how paper interacted with the other slightly unpredictable tools in one's writing kit, goose quills and iron gall ink. Um, so I think of this pot paper or Normandy paper or ordinary paper as just the most generic paper of the period, most widely used. So it's important to emphasize here that almost all writing paper was imported into England until the 1680s. I cited that 98% before of all paper. Um, There's very little paper being made in England. And in the 1680s, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes led to an influx of French Protestant papermakers, and they were able to form the Society of White Papermakers, and papermaking really took hold. But in this earlier period, the fact that such a key commodity for everyday life was not produced domestically was a problem. It was a national security issue in that the supply chain could easily be disrupted by war or religious conflict or bad weather or plague, disrupting England's bureaucratic structures. It was also, along with many other industries, a missed opportunity to empl employ those who were known at the time as the deserving poor, as able-bodied people who were idle um, because of lack of work. But producing paper domestically was problematic because in addition to requiring large capital investments for the mill itself to convert it, uh, to process rags, the production of paper also required a steady and plentiful supply of linen rags and technical expertise, both which were in short supply in wool and sheep centric England. Linen, which was made from flax, was one of England's top imports. And we know from various decrees and complaints that the linen, the old linen rags that were produced from you know, wearing out linen clothing in England were snapped up by rag collectors who then sent the rags to France. So the English were essentially buying paper imported from France, which had previously been linen cloth imported from France, and in between took a trip back to France as rags to be made into paper. So this gradually changed as more English farmers were encouraged to grow flax and a domestic linen and thread industry began to take shape. But still, even in 1655, Samuel Hartlib observed in a passage about, interestingly, about the benefits of using wool and linen rags as soil fertilizer. He writes, it's strange that we have not linen rags enough for paper as other nations have, but must have it from Italy, France, and Holland. And John, Ward, who was a vicar of Stratford-upon-Avon in the 1650s and 1660s, and many people made this observation, but here he says, there is little paper, I can't read underneath, <laughs> there is little paper made in England besides your common stuff, such as we print ballads and diurnals and other trash upon. The rest comes out of France, and a vast impost is laid therein by the king. So everybody realized like this didn't quite make economic or practical sense. In 1666, the first of the numerous burying in woolen acts were passed by parliament in order to support the woolen and the paper industries. So this act made it illegal to bury anyone in anything other than wool. So that kept the linen, which was the preferred thing to be wrapped in when you got buried, above ground so that it eventually could be converted into rags and then into paper. There had been previous attempts to establish paper making in England before the 1680s. John Tate in 1495, Remigius Guidon in Cambridge in 1550, and probably Sir Thomas Gresham in the 1570s. But it wasn't until someone named John Spillman uh, founded a paper, established a paper mill in 1587, that English paper really became a thing. So John Spillman was the Queen's jeweler and goldsmith. He came to England from Bavaria in the late 1570s, and he financed the establishment of a writing paper mill in Dartford in Kent and hired a group of fellow Germans, probably from Nuremberg, to operate it. 
Like other jewelers, he was also a money lender to the crown and to various nobility. And he was always transferring crown jewels from one place to another. So he, he knew a lot of people. He had a wide social network. In 1589, um, so about two years after he got the mill going and producing paper, he was granted a 10-year patent for the exclusive production of white writing paper. And this patent he canceled and then made a new one in 1597, which was for 14 years. So this patent gave him the exclusive production of white writing paper, but also included a monopoly on linen rags and other scraps which are listed as parchment scraps and scrolls, lime, leather shreds, clippings of cards, and old fishing nets. So this was mostly material to make the size, the gelatin size, which makes the paper go from being spongy after you make it to um, being able to be written on without the ink sort of feathering into the paper. And this patent also gave him the right to prevent others from establishing similar mills without his license and the right to prosecute anyone who sent rags out of the country. So he had thought this through, like how, you know, he, this was a foolproof way uh, to get the paper industry going in England. It's always been assumed that Spillman quickly abandoned making writing paper and had to resort to brown paper, which was used for wrapping, shopping and other things because one, he could not compete against imports in terms of price. So the French were selling at such a low level that he couldn't um, make any kind of profit. And two, he could not acquire enough quality rags to scale up his operations. So these assumptions are based on the fact that only a handful of examples of his paper had been identified until recently, just one printed book and a few letters. But in my research, I found hundreds of documents written on his paper that are in the state papers at the National Archives and then you know, at the Bodleian and Cambridge University Library and here in the, in the States. Um, and these have been examples of his paper in both manuscript and in print, ranging in date from 1587 to 1615 or so. So the chief way we have of identifying Spillman's paper is through his watermarks, which are decidedly English and royal, most likely reflecting the royal patent, which authorized him to be the sole producer of writing paper in England. Most of his paper is of ordinary quality, pretty much like pot paper, suitable for everyday use. Um, so I see this as sort of England's first really solid attempt to compete with the, the pot watermark cartel. I guess. So I'm just going to go through some of his watermarks. There are five of them or so. Um, this on the left, we have the crowned royal cipher. So these are the initials of Elizabeth Regina, Elizabeth the Queen. Um, and then Elizabeth died in 1603. And after that, he made watermarks for James I and his wife, Queen Anne, and uh, their son, Henry. The one on the right, and this cipher appeared on, you know, everywhere in the decorative landscape. So it would have been very familiar to people, as would this one next to it, which is the crowned Tudor rose. So this is the St. George's crown, sort of like the one that was just used in the most recent coronation. Um, and then the Tudor rose, which Elizabeth adopted as a, a heraldic badge. So heraldic badges are kind of like a coat of arms, but they're more like your um, logo or your like brand in a way. So it was these, these symbolic things that you could put on your cutlery and your clothing and your walls that were like, you know, somewhat connected to your coat of arms and used in the same way, but didn't have that official standing. So there's the crown Tudor rose. And then there are multiple versions of the crowned um, royal arms. So these are the, the coat of arms of the Queen of England with the fleur-de-lis and the lions, which are really hard to make out. Um, and then the, the, the garter 
of the Order of the Garter goes around like a belt with the motto of the Garter going around and then that same crown on top. And then here we have another of those heraldic badges or logos associated that Queen Elizabeth adopted um, as did her father, Henry VIII. And this is the crown portcullis. And you can see here, it appears in print, it's on an engraved image on the left, um, but also in manuscript. Um, and here's an image of the portcullis. We were, I was trying to, it's, in some cases, watermarks are actually visible to the naked eye. You don't need to hold them or you don't hold them up, like put them on transmitted light to see the watermark come out. But sometimes it just leaves such an impression on the paper. So, you know, the wire on the paper mold that is used to shape it. And so this, there was a conservator at the Beinecke when I was on fellowship there earlier this year, who was, we were experimenting with taking pictures in raking light so you could see sort of the hills and valleys of the watermark. So I thought that was kind of a striking picture. Um, here are some versions that pop up later after the first big spate of uh, paper production in between 1587 and 1590. And the middle one is actually on a manuscript in John Spillman's hand. So he was using his own paper, which makes sense um, for his, his manuscripts. And here's just an image where this is the front gate of St. John's College in Cambridge. And you can see the Tudor rose on the left with the watermark, John Spillman's watermark below, and then the coat of arms in the center, and then the portcullis with the chains on the side um, on the edifice, and then in watermark below. And I'd even argue that if you look at Elizabeth's signature, that E and that R are not similar to the ER of the cipher. So, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in these watermarks see what's next. Oh, and this is an example of that, the same ER cipher. And this is again, John Spillman using his own paper that he made for the queen, um, but in his capacity as the queen's jeweler. So the paper he made because he holds the royal patent is used to include a list of all these exquisite jewels uh, that were delivered into his possession. Um, by Sir Thomas Snibbet. And here I just break down, because I was like, I wonder if you know one of these watermarks is more dominant than some of the others. And you can see that the, the Tudor Rose and the portcullis and the gartered arms, there, you know, there's a lot of those. And then the ER cipher, there's a lot less. So that paper, which I do think was used, had a more limited um, range of distribution and was more geared towards Elizabeth who used it to write some autograph letters and to some of her uh, chief advisors like Burley who was drafting letters on her behalf. He'd, he must have had access to this ER cipher paper and he'd write it on the draft and then she would take like the next sheet potentially and copy out what he uh, wrote in her autograph to make it look like it was um, coming directly from her heart and mind. So Spillman's Mill seems to have been one of the primary suppliers of paper to the secretariats of the Queen's chief advisors, uh, who at the time were Walsingham and Lord Burley, um, during at least this three-year period from 1587 to the early 1590s. Um, but other office holders and courtiers used it as well. Um, Spillman's paper also found its way into manuscript literary works. Henry Woodhausen has found three of the manuscript copies of Philip Sidney's Arcadia, uh, which have his Spillman's watermark of the royal gartered arms. And then um, John Mark Philo has discovered three manuscript copies of a translation of Tacitus, which Henry Saville dedicated to Queen Elizabeth. Spillman's paper, was not just used for writing, as I said, and their earliest printed work is uh, one written by Thomas Churchyard, 
And I think this was probably commissioned from Thomas Churchyard, who was kind of a poet, as a marketing strategy uh, for Spillman's Mill. So you can see the title is a description and plain discourse of paper and the whole benefits that paper brings with rehearsal and setting forth in verse a paper mill built near Dartford by a high German called Master Spillman, jeweler to the Queen's Majesty. And it sets out in black letter like how amazing this paper mill was and how it was going to transform the economy. And uh, he was just wondrous about the whole process of making paper, which people in England had never really seen before. Uh, so it's a very funny, it's a very interesting poem. <laughs> Here you see uh, the a copy of this poem. It only exists, it only survives in uh, two, only two copies are known to survive, one at New York Public Library and one at the Bodleian. This one at New York Public Library is amazing. This is like gold, yellow, mustard, velvet with green silk ties that are still intact. And then I show, because this was a quarto volume, the watermark falls in the gutter. So here's just an image of that uh, royal gartered arms. So this first publication is printed on his own paper and it's advertising his amazing paper mill. In the same year, 1588, uh, The Mariner's Mirror was published. And this is a large folio publication, very expensive to produce. And it's printed almost entirely on paper with Spillman's crowned portcullis watermark. And there's a lot to say about this lavish navigational manual being published in 1588, the year of the defeat of the Spanish Armada, and the symbolism of the portcullis, which signified not only, I mean, it was acting as the royal badge of Queen Elizabeth, but it portcullis is literally an impenetrable defensive gate like this in real life. And the fact that this is one of the earliest examples of Spillman's watermark predating his patent. Uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing because of that and the sheet size was considerably larger than his normal paper. So he was going all out uh, with this paper. So this clearly, I think, seems to be a way for him to showcase his work and his arrival as a uh, paper maker in England. Um, you know, there are other publications in 1593, Hooker's first edition of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. In 1601, there was a royal proclamation declaring uh, the Earl of Essex's treason. That was on Spillman's paper. But no one has yet done, I was focusing on his watermarks in manuscript, not really in print, except I was able to sort of triangulate these ones. But I don't think anyone's done an exhaustive search or even a targeted search for his watermarks in other books printed in England in this late 1580s, 1590s period, which would be useful to see if these particular examples I just told you about are quite intentionally deploying English paper with royal watermarks to amplify the overall political and social intentions of the printed text, or if this is just the tip of the iceberg and his paper is turning up everywhere and so we shouldn't read too much into, into it. So what was amazing about Spillman's paper, in addition to the highly detailed and iconographic watermarks and its prevalence in throughout the administrative paperwork in the late 1580s was its price. So this is a quotation from a letter written in 1590 in which we learned that his paper was considered to be very large and very good and that it costs five shillings and six pence per ream. Uh, and again, a ream is 500 sheets. So if you break that down to what it costs per choir of 25 sheets, it'd be slightly less than four pence a choir, which is exactly what people were expecting to pay for this kind of paper. So it means he was you know, successfully in compet or kind of successfully in, in competition with the French paper. And in talking with Tim Barrett this morning and seeing the way watermarks are made, I have new appreciation for the fact that Spillman was a trained goldsmith and jeweler. So even if he didn't make those highly detailed watermarks himself, 
he had act he could train people and he had access to highly skilled artisans who could okay so i've talked about the flowering of paper choices in this period and the expansion of the vocabulary for describing new kinds of paper and i've talked about ordinary pop paper and john spellman's english paper um, and how people note that it's odd that paper is not made in England, um, but it's in rare mo moments. Oh, here's some of his, his work as a jeweler. This is the ostrich cup. So there's an actual ostrich egg uh, in that cup. And then you can see his IS monogram for John Spillman. Okay, so um, it's in these moments of articulated failure that we really begin to appreciate that the substrate conveyed meaning. So this is an example of a postscript where someone writes, I must crave pardon for writing on so bad paper. And his excuse is he's lost the key of his desk and can come to no other. So if you look at the letter itself, you can see it's not a full sheet. So it's just part of a single leaf. Um, and possibly harvested from the address leaf of a letter that he had received himself. And it has some uneven um, deckel edge and cutting and some bleed through. So it's clearly like not good paper, but he just wanted to make sure that his boss knew that he knew it was bad paper and not to be offended by it and use the excuse of the locked writing desk to avoid impropriety. And you see this awareness in higher status among higher status people as well. So this is Philip Sidney opening a letter to Queen Elizabeth. This rude piece of paper shall presume because of your majesty's commandment. So rude paper, it may just be a convention of humility, but um, it's written on a bifolium, so a full sheet, so that checks, that's okay. But the watermark is a pot watermark. So he's using ordinary paper um, not any kind of special paper in a letter written to the queen. So I think that is part of the rudeness. Um, and you can sort of see that the edges are unevenly trimmed. So it was like he was trying to remove the deckel but didn't have a proper uh, cutting device at hand. So um, there's a lot of unevenness there. Um, and the Duke of Anjou also was self-conscious about his paper in writing to Queen Elizabeth. And that, that Duke of Anjou example, the paper is uneven on the edges as well. So the idea of an unrefined or offensive decal edge seems consistent with the increase in references in paper purchases to cut paper in the 1640s and 50s. So this would be paper that would be pre-trimmed by a bookbinder rather than amateurishly cut at home. Samuel Pepys commented, well, here's an example of a decal, just in case people haven't really focused in on the edge of um, handmade paper from this period. So it's caused by the paper fibers collecting between the decal frame and the mold during the paper making process. And it gives it this sort of raggedy edge, which most people in the, you know, in Shakespeare's period just left on, but there was starting, it was starting to become trendy to, to cut it off. Samuel Peeps uh, commented in 1665 when he was looking at letters from like 70 years earlier of the Earl of Leicester and Mary Queen of Scots. He said, but Lord, how poorly methinks they wrote in those days and on what plain uncut paper. By 1665, duckle edges, which we somewhat fetishize today, were clearly out of fashion. Um, Sorry, I wasn't getting the slide I wanted there. In 1699, John Houghton, and this is a reference that Beth Yale gave to me, so thank you for this a long time ago. Um, he described what happened to all of the deckle edge trimmings. Uh, and he writes, a great deal of the finest of the writing paper is cut and some cut and gilt on the edges. And the cuttings are sold to the silk, sock, silk stocking trimmers to burn a little and a little, to singe off the loose hairs that are on them. And I'd love to understand that a little bit better, why these deckle edges, these like little scraps of paper fibers were perfect for singeing. 
Here we have Samuel Hartlib mentioning that paper with gilt edges comes from Venice and Genoa. And so this brings me to the last section of the talk, which is about Venice paper. This is a love letter um, folded into a tiny little packet, like this small, not, this is so huge on the screen. And it's a love letter to her first cousin, Louis Baggett. During their failed courtship, she sent tightly folded letters to him, um, writing in a really pretty italic hand using like curly cues on her Ks. And she folded each letter in what they called the pleated style. Um, a style that you folded it like multiple times in half. So you got this narrow little sliver that became the packet. And she, the trend was to wrap it in this silk embroidery floss of any color and then seal it on the front and back. And this style of folding was French in origin. It, I first have noticed it coming into England in the 1570s. But the paper they used was almost invariably half sheets of Italian paper. Um, and this Italian paper, or Venice paper, had this a really distinct, very nice creamy tone, a smooth texture, usually gilt edges, and it was thin and translucent. Her letters and anyone who got a pleated letter like this, it was like receiving a gift. It was a gesture of love meant to be refolded and stored by Lewis in a special box or bag with her other letters. And it was signaling her fidelity whenever he looked at them. So Lewis, if he received a letter like this on this kind of paper, he didn't even need to read the words on the page to know the intent of the letter. Um, you know, it was the handwriting, the silk, the folds, but most of all the paper itself said it all. And I don't know if you can see on the big screen, but if you look on the right side, just to the right of the red seal, you can almost see the gilt edges of the paper. It's just kind of like yellow right along the edges. So the presence of gilt on the edge of a single leaf of paper is not something that we are conditioned to seek out. Um, but in the early modern period, it was clearly a thing. There's a letter writing manual from the period that recommends that letters should be written upon fine perfumed and gilted paper, if you please. While the gilt edges of Venice paper are almost entirely invisible to us now, as we view these manuscripts under neutral lighting in sterile reading rooms, imagine receiving a letter like this in a perhaps a dark wood paneled room. It would be relatively easy to glimpse a glint of gold as one opened the letter under the raking light of the sun through a window or from a candle and internalize the intimate non-textual golden gesture. Um, so that was, this is a letter from John Donne at the Folger. And here's an example. It's very hard to photograph and get to focus on the edge, but this one you can see, I caught the glint uh, at the National Archives. Um, and this is a letter from Philip Sidney. So this is Venice paper. This is, um, Venice paper was widely acknowledged to be the finest paper you could buy. So Fuller in the History of the Worthies of England, he describes Venice paper as mirroring the qualities of the Venetians who make it neat, subtle, and court-like. And then he goes on to describe the personalities of French and Dutch paper as well. The term Venice paper started to populate the account books of high status people in the 1590s. So I first noticed it in 1592 in the account book of Bess of Hardwick. And it continued to be regarded as a premium paper for the next 100 years. Venice paper was not actually produced in Venice. It was made in the Venetian Republic, but way um, west of Venice in valleys with fast running streams, uh, you know, particularly on the western bank of Lake Garda, where the mills were powered by the Toscolano River. So Venice was a port from which this regionally produced paper was then shipped onward um, to the east, particularly the Ottoman court in Constantinople used Venetian paper or overland to northern cities on the continent or by sea to London or Bruges. Although paper was made in many other Italian cities uh, in this period, English consumers of the finest writing paper refer consistently to Venice paper in their accounts and not to Genoa paper or Fabriano paper. So 
in order to determine what sort of fine paper qualified as Venice paper when I was encountering nice paper in the archive, um, I looked at correspondence written from Venetians and from English people who were writing from Venice with the assumption that they were using Venetian paper. Um, so this included the correspondence of Sidney and Sir Henry Wotton. And I compared the watermarks on their correspondence to watermarks on the correspondence of people in England who had purchased Venice paper and found multiple matches. And so that sort of gave me a key to like finding it more in the wild and less controlled situations. And many of these watermarks, I realized sort of partway through had countermarks that appeared in the lower corner of the opposite side of the sheet. And I learned that that was typical of um, paper produced in the Venetian Republic. So the most common sort of Venice paper in use in England in the early 17th century, there are many others too, um, but this particular one really just, I started seeing it everywhere. It's I think as a pennant watermark, often with a G and then a three or a Z on the other side. And it's like a split pennant in this example. Um, and again, this is almost like a pot, like there are many variations um, of this. And then here is another one where the pennant is sort of longer, narrower, and draped around the pole. And then I recently found one where it's like the flag is just waving in the wind. It's really, it's amazing how it's, it's done. So I need to do more research on that one. Um, these pennants, so these are the two main variants. Venice paper rapidly became associated with status, refinement, cultural capital, and wealth and sometimes satirically so. Oh, here's just, I held it up against light, just to show kind of the thinness of the paper. Um, and this is a crossbow, which is another uh, popular in England um, example of Venice paper. So Thomas Brown wrote a play in 1697, Physicalize a Bleeding, and in it there's this character, Retorto Spatula Dolceroso, who is an Italian apothecary in London. And he, um, in this quote, is responding to a comment that outlandish apothecaries make up things far better than our English apothecaries do theirs. So he talks about how his boluses are put up all in gilt paper. Um, a choir cost me five shillings the cutting, which is a lot. Besides, the paper is pure Venice paper. All this a la modo d'Italiano to make the physic taste the better, work the better, and look the better. Uh, Venice paper also turns up in a, a translation of Don Quixote in 1687, where Don Quixote pokes fun at Sancho's uh, simple transparency saying, I take thee to be as clear as a sheet of gilt Venice paper. Venice paper was not just for fancy people writing letters to each other, I learned. It's many attributes, it's thinness, whiteness, smoothness, translucency, made it useful for other purposes as well. So there are many artist manuals from this period describe a method of reproduction that involves dipping a sheet of Venice paper in linseed oil, then wiping it dry. And then that makes the paper totally transparent. So you lay it upon a painted or printed picture, you trace the image with black lead, and then flip the tracing over and trace it on the back side with like a stylus or a, um, a quill. And that imparts the pencil onto the new blank sheet of paper. Natural philosophers were also thrilled by everything they could do experiment wise with Venice paper, um, including Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke. And there's a funny reference in a chapter um, on heat and cold where Walter Charlton, he briefly digresses to describe a neat and yummy trick uh, where you take a sheet of the thinnest Venice paper and you fold it upwards in the margins and then you add oil, which is sort of infused into it and you lay it upon a gridiron over burning coals and it doesn't catch fire, which some cooks observing use to fry bacon upon a sheet of paper. So Venice paper you can use to fry bacon. Uh, 
But they were also, these natural philosophers were quick to observe that these were superficial qualities, these, this translucency and beautiful uniformity. And this disappeared under magnification. So as they were sticking everything under microscopes to see what things look like at the end of the 17th century. And uh, one person said he put, when a man looks through a microscope upon a sheet of the finest and smoothest Venice paper, which seems to the naked eye and most exquisite touch to be equal and terse in all parts of its surface, he shall discern it to be so full of eminences and cavities or small hills and valleys as the most pregnant and prepared imagination cannot suppose anything more unequal or impolite to the horror of Venice paper under a microscope when it, and, and it's like, it's a traitor to him that it looks so beautiful um, to the naked eye. And Henry Power, another natural philosopher, noted that if you like drew a line on a piece of Venice paper and looked at it under a microscope, ragged, indented, and discontinued by the rugosities and seeming protuberances of the paper, in which likewise you may see whole clouds, as it were, of rags, the primitive materials thereof. So I'll end with that image or that idea of whole clouds of rags. As my fellowship was ending, my work on paper took an unexpected swerve when um, Alan Nelson pointed me to the records of the court of Bridewell, where I came across a number of references to rag women who had been apprehended in the beginning of the 17th century for being unlicensed, for being vagrants, for petty theft. And then in the case of this woman, Claire Causey, for trying to convince a group of rag women to sell their rags to John Spillman. So suddenly John Spillman is back in the story um, rather than to Bridewell Hospital as they were required to do. So the records of the court of Bridewell help us better understand the complexities of the English paper scene and the battle between the crown with its royal patents and the city of London with its ancient rights and privileges to control the rag trade. In 1600, the Common Council declared that all unlicensed and unbadged rag gatherers would be prosecuted and provided uh, details on how honest, poor, and aged, and aged meant anyone over the age of 40, they clarified, men and women could receive a badge which had London's coat of arms on it, which they were to wear hanging openly on their breasts um, you know, as they wandered around collecting rags. And they could only sell their rags to Bridewell whose tenants, so this was Bridewell Hospital, so the people who lived there were unhoused men and women brought in for petty crimes and orphaned children. And these people would then be set to work cleaning the rags as part of their reform or punishment. So Spillman needed someone on the ground to infiltrate and disrupt the city's hold on the rag trade. And his servant, Clara Causey, uh, was who he picked. She was caught trying to convince the rag gatherers, um, including goodwife Muffin, the rag gatherer of Turnagain Lane, um, that working for her was better than working for Bridewell Hospital. So Spillman employed Causey to navigate the system from the bottom up while he exercised a top-down approach, leveraging his status as a queen's jeweler. Like he kept on getting privy council to write letters to the city of London saying it's not fair. And then the city of London would write back and say, we have our ancient rights and privileges, so it's very fair. Causey seems to be acting as an organizer, recruiting other women to report to her rather than to Bridewell's official rag collector. And Spillman may have selected a female servant, perhaps because of her ability to embed herself in and gain the confidence of female rag gatherers encouraging them to betray their license relationship and promising to free them from prison if they got caught. I'm not sure she would have had the power to do that. So this was enormously exciting to finally get a glimpse into the murky world of rag gathering. And it really points to the humanity of paper, the people who scavenged for and cleaned the dirty rags, a stratum of labor that is usually erased in book history studies. In his book, The Intimacy of Paper in Early and 19th Century American Literature, Jonathan Sunshine describes each individual sheet of paper as an archive of human labor, most of it now anonymous to us. 
So even though we think of early modern papermaking as dominated by male papermakers, you know, who work at the vat and they're the coochers, if we see each sheet of paper as both a cloud of rags and an archive of human labor, then that archive is not surprisingly predominantly female. And I will end there. Thank you.